we don't need a song to lift praise, right? Come on, lift your own words. Just come with thanksgiving before him right now. Oh, we praise you. We exalt you for all you Shake everything that needs to be 
break every strong. Come on, any stronghold, any addictions. Oh, they're broken in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. One more time, because your name is power. in us, Lord Jesus. Anything that doesn't belong to you, consume it, Jesus. We surrender to you, Holy Spirit. We are yours. We are yours. In Jesus' name, in this same attitude of worship, we're going to ask you to, if you have your communion elements, you can pull them out for a minute. If you're in the front and don't want to go back, we have a basket here with the communion elements. You can stay in the front if you like. Pastor Tommy's going to come. He's going to lead us through communion. Powerful time of worshiping, and I love the fact that we sang "I Speak Jesus," and how appropriate it is that we're going to participate in Holy Communion after saying those words "I Speak Jesus." But Jesus told us; He spoke to us. He spoke to the Apostle Paul in First Corinthians eleven twenty three. Jesus said to the disciples, He knew what was going to. First of all, He knew what was going to happen. He knew what he was about to endure for our sins and for us. And he's at the table with his disciples and he takes a piece of bread. And the very first thing that he does is he gave thanks to the Father. He gave thanks to his Lord. That just shows us the Lordship that we need in our lives. But then he looks at all of his disciples and he says, This is my body broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to do something a little different here. I'm going to ask you guys to just hold this bread up. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I don't want anyone looking around to see who's got their eyes closed or not. I just want you to hold this piece of bread up and I'm going to be quiet. We're going to have a little instrumental music going, but I want you to search your heart. I want to, I want you to search your heart to say, God, what is it inside of me that you need to take from me? What is it in my life that I want to give to you? see tears are coming down in people's cheeks because the Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now. So just stay in that posture of, of prayer. Just keep your eyes closed as we pray. God, just as your son taught us, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, your only son that you gave to this world. And Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for taking all of the punishment that we deserve. And we deserve it, Lord. We know we deserve it. But you loved us enough to say, no, I'm taking this on your behalf. You took all of the, the lashings, everything that we deserve, you took it. Your unconditional love was on full display as it is every day. And so, Jesus, we remember, just as you instructed us, just as you taught your disciples, and it's been taught to us, that we know it is holy and it is about you. We maybe can't see you with our eyes, but we see you in our spirit. We know you're with us. And so today, we are holding this bread up. We have searched our hearts coming before you, Jesus, giving it all over to you and, and just declaring that you are our God and we don't want to carry this anymore. We don't want to have the weight and the burden of it anymore. We want to give it over to you. And so we just declare that in Jesus name and everyone take the bread.
Now in the same light, Jesus takes the cup and he says, this is the new covenant. Take this every time in remembrance of me. And I love the power of that one word in that phrase, every time. Communion's not just something you do once a month. It's whenever you need Jesus to be a part of your life. It's every time that you say, Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I know you are. So he's saying, every time that you remember me, take this in remembrance of me. So we hold up the blood. We hold up our new covenant as a reminder that we need to take this every time. So Jesus, we thank you again. We thank you for this new covenant that you washed all of our sins and made us pure. We know we're not perfect, Jesus, but we know that you are, and that's why we come to you. We come to you because you take our sins, and you have promised us that we will have eternal life. In the word, it says that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no way to go to heaven except through you. And that is the new covenant that we celebrate today, that we praise today, that we rejoice today in. Because through your suffering and this new covenant, we have eternal life with you in heaven. And so Jesus, we know that you've defeated, you've defeated hell, you have conquered the grave, and you are resurrected. And we know we will get to see you again. And so we declare that by the blood, by the new covenant, and the power of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the cup. One thing we like to do when we take communion is we get to enjoy that in a a building with other people that are celebrating Holy Communion with each other. But there are brothers and sisters around our world that don't get that privilege or that luxury. And in Matthew 18, it says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, you will find me. And so I'm going to ask all of us to just have our hands up. I just want us to have our hands up as if we are unified in prayer, as we are coming before and we're going to pray for the persecuted church, knowing that there are definitely more than two of us here. And Jesus is not just here with us, but he's wherever our brothers or sisters who are being persecuted are at. So Jesus, we come before you humbly today. But we know just as we say, there is power in your name. And so Jesus, today we are praying for all of our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted for speaking the name of Jesus, for wanting to share the gospel, the good news of you, Jesus. So Father, we are here today united in prayer saying the name of Jesus, the name above all names, that as we are speaking your name, that you are with our brothers and sisters, that if there are people who are wanting to persecute them or to beat them, that when they are approaching them, that the Holy Spirit will convict them in such a mighty and powerful way that they'll they'll turn and walk away. And when somebody says, why didn't you do something? They're going to say, because of Jesus. Because in them, I saw what we've heard about. In them, I know the truth. The truth is setting me free. Jesus, I pray that you will give finances, that you'll give books, that you'll give workers, people to go out into these areas, unafraid, knowing that you are with them to speak Jesus to them. Father, we pray that you will just bless every single one of our our brothers and sisters. You will give them a supernatural strength, a supernatural joy, a supernatural endurance, that no matter what, in the hardest of times, they will have a smile on their face. They will raise their hands up to heaven, and they say, Jesus is with me. And so today, Father, we just declare that the name of Jesus that we speak on the platform is the name of Jesus that is being spoken anywhere in this world. Amen. And we declare that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Well, if you would like to take a moment, just turn to the person next to you, in front of you, behind you. Don't make it so secluded. But just greet one another, and then you can go ahead and have a seat. All right, well, an official good morning, Radiant Church. How's everyone doing today? All right, we got three participants. Let's try that one more time. Good morning, Radiant Church. All right, there we go. We're getting there. We're going to go ahead and welcome everyone who's a first, second, or third time guest. We're also going to welcome everyone who's watching online with us. Thank you for choosing Radiant Church. We are so excited to partner with you. We're excited you chose us as a place to come and worship, to come and pray, and where you just get to be fed by the Word of God, because that's what we're all about. You saw people up here at the altars passionately praising and worshiping because we passionately follow Jesus. That's what we do here at Radiant Church. And so this, if, if this is your first, second, or third time with us, I'd like to invite you to fill out a connection card. There's a few ways you guys can do it. If you're live at any of our campuses, on the seat back in front of you, you'll see a little card that says connection card. Fill out as much information as you're willing to share. And here's what's awesome about that is when you turn that card in, we're actually going to reach out to you. We want to communicate with you. We want to connect with you. We want you to know about Radiant Church. But before you turn that in, I want you to flip it over because here's the other great part about those connection cards. You put down a personal prayer request and every Monday, we as a staff pray over every single one of those prayer request cards. So talk about a way you get to have someone praying for you every day this week. You will have that here at Radiant Church. Now, if you are like, hey, I don't have a pin. Sorry, we maybe ran out of pen. Someone might have took them. You can also download the Radiant Church app. You can fill out a connection card there. But whatever you do, fill out a connection card. And if it's the live version, if it's the handout version, at the end of service, drop that off in one of our offering receptacles so we can uh, collect those. Now, if you've already done that, you might be saying, okay, I've, I've filled that out. What's my next step? Your next step is to go through our sync classes. Now, these are four online classes. They're led by our lead pastors, Todd and Kelly Hudnall. But what's amazing about these is you'll hear from our lead pastors as they share the heart, the vision, and the mission of Radiant Church, that we are wanting to grow a community of passionate followers of Jesus Christ who not just impact our community, but our world. Because we want to be world changers, amen? We want to be people that spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're all about here at Radiant Church. Now you might be saying, okay, Pastor Tommy, what, everything you're saying is great, but you've got a big shiny thing in your hand and it keeps flashing in my eyes. Well, you're right. Two weeks ago, we were able to have Eric Metaxas give us a sermon through uh, the road. And he talked about this book, Is Atheism Dead? And so many of you had said, oh man, I want to get a copy of that book. So we ordered some of these books. They are for sale in the Missions Cafe. So make sure that you go to the Missions Cafe today and get a copy of Is Atheism Dead? Trust me, you'll read one page and then you'll read the whole book and you'll be like, wow, that was a blessing. So make sure you grab a copy of this before you leave today. One of the ways we honor God here at Radiant Church is through the receiving of tithes and offerings. And, you know, we're just big about just joyfully expressing our love and desire for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we can do that is through tithes and offerings. In the seat back in front of you is a tithe and offering envelope. You can uh, put whatever amount the Lord's putting on your heart. Put those in the offering receptacles at the end of service. You can also text any amount to 84321. That will go directly in for us. Now, we love to give back to God, and Pastor Mark from our North Campus and our youth pastor, he has got a phenomenal message today that he's going to give us from our North Campus. So if you would, just bow your heads with me. We're going to pray over the tithes and offerings. We're going to pray for Pastor Mark's message, and then we're going to go ahead and watch him. So Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for just giving us this freedom, this love and desire to seek you with all of our hearts. And if we're not seeking you, God, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will find us no matter where we're at, in no matter moment, and that you will convict us. You will show us a holy conviction to where we want to know you, that we have a desire for you, that we want to scream your name from the mountains and from the neighborhoods and from the workplaces. 
Father, we also know that in your word it says, if we bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that you will give a blessing upon us. You will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we could never imagine. And so, Father, we just, we give to you what's already yours today. And we just pray that you will uh, just bless both the gift as well as the giver. And it will grow and further the kingdom because that's what it's all about, God, is spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you are with us not only here at Central, at our North Campus online. Holy Spirit, have your way in us. And we pray a fresh anointing upon Pastor Mark. We know that you have given the words that Pastor Mark is speaking today because someone in this room, someone online, multiple people need to hear this. They need to have that transformational message. So we just pray that it will be like tongues of fire falling down upon us and that we will be transformed, that we will be changed and we will no longer walk the way we feel we need to walk, but we will walk the way you want us to walk. And we declare that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Radiant Church. Oh, come on. Is someone excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Come on. I am excited to be here with you today. Let's pause. Let's give it up. I mean, we have our amazing Central Campus and Central Campus Pastor, Pastor Tommy and Pastor Dustin at Woodland Park. Let's give it all at all three campuses. Let's give it up for all those online. Come on. Welcome. Welcome. We welcome you. We're glad that you're here with us today. Now, just last week, Pastor Todd ended his message with a challenge. Does anyone remember that challenge? That challenge to make a gap or make a space in your life for the Holy Spirit to show up this week, which was last week. So now it's your homework is due. <laughs> now, so here's my idea. I think we should bombard Pastor Todd's personal email account with an, right? Let's, let's do it. So if God showed up, if you made space for the Holy Spirit this week and the Holy Spirit showed up in an amazing giant way, let's email Pastor Todd and let him know about it. It's his email. at Pastor Todd. It sounds like a joke, but it's for real. Pastor Todd at radiantchurch.org. But here's the thing. If God showed up in a really small, tiny, itty bitty way, oh, come on, man. It's not our job. It's not our job to rank what God does. It's our job to give him praise. So if you made space for the Holy Spirit, and it seems so small and almost silly to brag on him, I still want to encourage you to email Pastor Todd, Pastor Todd at radiantchurch.org, and brag on Jesus. Let's brag on him. We make big of the small things God does. We make big of the big things God does. We brag on him. Our job is not to rank what he does. Our job is to give him worship and to give him praise. Hallelujah. Come on. Just the other day, my man Eric, one of our amazing facilities guys here at Radiant Church, was telling me that when it was 5,000 degrees below zero the other day, he said that his car door would not open. Okay, like it wouldn't unlock. And he tried everything. He's a very smart dude. He tried like 12 different tricks, and none of them opened it. And then he's like, oh, wait a second. I should pray. <laughs> it's like, I, my, my buddy Eric, I'm like, I get that. I'm like, so many times I try my own and then I pray. Oh my goodness. Guess what happened? You know what happened. It like it opened like it was a nice summer day. He prayed. He's like, Jesus, please help this door open. And the door opened immediately. Like he needed in there to get some more stuff done. And he got in there and just like that. We make big of the small things that God does. We make big. I mean, I could just stand up here all day long and just brag on Jesus and it would be worth our time just to brag on him. That's all he deserves all the praise. He deserves all the glory. He's done it before, and he's going to do it again. He's done it before, and he's going to do it today. Come on. <laughs> I'm excited to be here with you. Jesus is here. 
Jesus is here. Have you heard that Mario Murillo is going to be here July 11th through the 14th? Is that exciting to anybody? Come on, that's pretty cool. Guess what? Guess what? The God that Mario Murillo serves is here today. The God that heals when Mario Murillo prays is here today. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Save that date, students. I get to announce it right here. I get to announce it at adult service first. Before the students even hear it, high school and middle school camp is going to be happening at the exact same time as our revival of Mario Murillo. So during the day, we're going to have rock and roll fun all day long. And then at night, we're going to have our camp speaker will be Mario Murillo. It'll, more information to come, but I'm pretty stoked about it. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Now, it's not too late. Here's your youth commercial. It's not too late to sign up for winter retreat. It's two weeks from right now. We have 30-some plus amazing youth leaders. I think 20 of them or 24 of them are coming. It's amazing students. This is for high school only. That's freshmen through seniors. The price is $225. Guess what? In 20 plus years, I have never seen a student not come to winter retreat or summer camp or even a mission trip because of cash, because of money. God will always provide a way. He, if it's his will, it's his bill. He'll make it happen. Man, you know what that makes me think of? That makes me think of a building right out here that's supposed to be built. Come on, God. It's your will. It's your bill. Make it happen in Jesus' name. Amen. So if, you're, if you have a student, email us at Radiant Youth at, um, Radiant Youth, at Radiant, oh, Radiant Youth, Youth at RadiantChurch.org, and we will make sure that happens. Jesus is here. Today we're going to talk about the title of the sermon tonight. Today is, um, is <laughs> Never Give Up. Never give up. Never give up. I was about halfway done or two-thirds done, and I thought of Churchill. He said that once. Never, never give up. Now that's Something like that. Okay. Um, but you know what? It, it's, a pretty good, it's a pretty good phrase for us as followers of Jesus, to never give up, to keep our eyes on him. It's almost a little more negative than I want to be, the never give up, because it's more of that, because we have such hope, because our hope is not in ourself. Our hope is not in our situation. I was reading Pastor Todd's, one of his messages, because we're preaching Break Free at Youth, and he talks about our faith is not in ourselves, right? This is one of his amazing lines. Our faith's not in ourselves. Our faith's not in our own ability. Our faith is not in our faith. I like that. My faith is not in my faith. My faith is in Jesus Christ. So I don't have to give up. And I don't, but here's the deal though, guys. I talk to parents and adults all week long. And, uh, and I, I hear that there are so many times and so many situations on a weekly basis, I talk to someone that's ready to give up. They're ready to toss in the towel. And I don't mean figuratively. I don't mean like story time, like this is fictitious. I mean, last week, the week before, the week before that. And you know what? I don't blame them. I don't blame them in the way of, I get the pain, man. I mean, if we just real life. Radiant Church, who are we? It's everyone next to us. Central Campus, Woodland Park, all online. It's real life. I mean, just the other day, I was at the gym, and I was talking to someone, talking to a man about 10 years my senior, has life by the string, or life on the string, something about life. Good. Life's going, <laughs> right? Life on the string. Finances are rocking. He loves his kids. He's got some major hurdles to jump every day. We're having a real life conversation. Some major hurdles to jump every day. But he's like, is this it? So he's like, I'm 44. He has to be in his mid 50s. He's like, this is it? That's it? I mean, I, I got, that's, this is all I got? This is all to do? Am I supposed to go chase more money? Is that, what, what's the next? I talked to a, a husband last week, a wife from a different family the week before that. I mean, I talked to many parents. I've talked to many people, and, and they're like, they don't want to give up on marriage, but they're like, I don't know. They don't see the way out or the way, the way for help. They don't, they don't see the, the hope. They don't see a way for it to, to, for it to succeed. They want to toss in the towel. Man, I talk to parents every week about their amazing, beautiful children. And sometimes they're ready to toss in that towel. They're not going to. They're not going to quit. And you know why? Because we're not going to, we're going to, if, if there's anything, I mean, if, if there's any way, ra- if there's, there's no way they're going to quit if, if Radiant Church has anything to do with it. Come on, that's where you can say amen. Because we're here for each other. And Pastor Mark's here for you. Pastor Todd and Kelly, they're the most real people. I mean, to think about how they passed, you hear me brag on them, it's because I get to walk with them off stage. Okay, do you get that? Because they're the most real people I've ever met in my life as far as 2,000 people in their church, and, they, and each person, well, they'll, stop on a, they'll stop on a dime or whatever the phrase is to, to be there for you. I mean, and all of our pastors, Pastor Tommy and Pastor Dustin and everyone, our worship pastors, our staff, but you know what? We're the church. Okay? We're the church. Before I was ever on a stage, man, I was just a follower of Jesus. I'm going to fight for marriages and fight for your students and fight for our kids. Come on. Come on. Don't give up. We're never giving up. Never giving up. 
Never give up. Never give up. Our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is not in our ability. Our hope is not in our amazing children even. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Joshua 6, we find the Israelites with a new leader in a new land. Moses had just passed down the leadership to Joshua. The spies had just returned with some great intel from Jericho. The prostitute Rahab had just saved her own life and her family's life by making a deal with those same spies, by helping them and letting, her out, letting them out their back window and rescuing them. And the Israelite army of 40,000 men had just crossed on dry ground the Jordan River. And there they stand in front of the most fortified city of all time up to that point, Jericho, double-walled city. Sounds like your Monday, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like, yeah, sounds like Monday. Absolutely. We're going to read this. Let's start at Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one came out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. That right there is a sermon. I just love it so much. I mean, I think, G I think Jesus could say the same thing to you right now, or maybe God would say the same thing to you right now, going, see, I gave you my best. He's pointing at Jesus. I gave you the Holy Spirit. He's pointing at the Holy Spirit. See, the victory's already yours, guys. The victory's already yours, Marco. That's what Jesus calls me. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with the king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. That's a lot... That's a lot of blowing. <laughs> Can you imagine 40,000 men walking around your city? I've walked around this campus and prayed over like North Campus, um, and, and it takes a while just to walk around this, this small campus. I've, uh, often, we will office out of Central Campus, and I often will walk around that. It takes a few minutes just to walk around um, that, and it's just a few acres. And can you imagine? Here, here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. Okay. Patience. <laughs> Okay, that's supposed to be awkward on purpose. Okay, I obviously, um, I do ram's horns lessons on the weekends if you'd like to learn how to blow a ram's horn. Okay, no, no. But can you imagine hearing that from seven horns, complete silence. Joshua has told his men to be quiet and the fear that starts to grip the king's heart inside Jericho, the fighting men that starts, the fear that starts to grip their heart. They're not going anywhere. They just march for six days. They're not going anywhere. Oh, please stop. Oh, please stop. I think the reason I pause at this part is because I think that's the exact same thing that happens in the demons in hell and the demons on this world, Satan himself, when you don't stop praying, when I don't stop praying, the fear grips their heart. They heard a horn. When the demons hear you pray, they're going, please just stop. Please just stop. Please stop praying about your marriage. Please stop praying about your kids. Oh, please stop. Please stop. They're not going to stop. Oh, that makes me excited. So I'm never going to give up. I'm going to keep on praying. Even when I want to stop praying, I'm going to go with those guys didn't like, really, this is it? Like, you want me to keep my sword in my sheath and you want those guys to blow their horns? That's how we're going to win this? Verse 5, when you hear them sound the long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. But Joshua had com commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voice, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had... So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Man, I feel like the, so, those soldiers. Mark, just keep marching. Mark, just keep marching. Come on, keep doing, doing it. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. Keep marching. Verse 20. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted. And the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave the loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in. And, the, and they took the city. The King James Version said it went straight down into the ground and made it level. That's very exciting. Do you know what Joshua knew on lap six? Do you know what he knew on lap six? I'm going to ask it one more time. Do you know what Joshua knew on lap six? The same thing you and I know right before God shows up for us. See, he, we know the end of Joshua's story. We don't know what chapter we're in until our chapter is done. We don't know when he's, the wall's going to collapse. He, all he knew was this. All he knew was that, God, you did it before. You're going to do it again. God, you made a promise, and you're a promise keeper. So I'm going to keep marching. The only thing that Joshua knew was that God told him to do something, and he had, an, uh, he had an option. We look at it like the end of the story. We know everything. But he had an option. He didn't have to get up. 
He didn't have to go. But he, he, what he knew was, you've done it before, you're going to do it again. I know you've done it before, you're going to do it again. I'll say it again. I, 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 maybe this is for me. You've done it before, you're going to do it again. Do it again. All he knew in that moment was that he'd done it before, you're going to do it again. Never give up. When we take our eyes off God's promises, all we see is a wall. All we see is an army. All we see is our sick loved one. All we see is our real life situation, fill in the blank. But God is using that barrier to stretch us. He's using that barrier to shape us according to his promise. That barrier will come down when he is ready. That's hard, but it's true. Our job is to keep marching, to keep worshiping, to keep following him until he gives this order to stop in celebration when the promise is fulfilled. In 2 Kings, we find our main man, Elisha, God's main man, Elisha, with the army, or I'd say the enemy number one, breathing down his neck. The king of Aram was trying to kill him and trying to destroy Israel. And they set up traps everywhere trying to catch the king and to try to kill Israel. This is verse 8 in 2 Kings chapter 6. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After um, conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing this place because the Arameans are going to be down there. So the king of Israel checked out this place that it was indicated by God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his offers in and he demanded for, of them, tell me which one of us is on the side of the king of Israel. None of us, oh my Lord, oh my king, said the officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out who, where, who, where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men to capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, oh no, he drops his copy, right? It shatters everywhere. My Lord, what shall we do? Um, the servant asked. Don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. The Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. We're going to pause right here because what hit me every time I read this over and over the last few weeks for this very moment, because I thought, you know what? I mean, just this week, I think it may have been yesterday afternoon. If, if it's good enough for Elisha to pray over his servant, that's good enough for us to pray over our kids. God, open their eyes so they can see how big you are. Open their eyes so they can have their own relationship with you, Jesus. Open their eyes so they can experience your grace. Open their eyes so they can experience your mercy. Open their eyes so they can experience their, have their own relationship with you, Jesus. Good enough for Elisha's servant, good enough for us to pray over our kiddos. Verse 18, as the enemy came, down toward him. Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness and Elisha, as Elisha had, Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road. This is not the city. Okay, so George Lucas stole everything from the Bible. It's like, this is not the road. This is not the city. Little side note. Okay, follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked around and they saw that they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? He's a little excited there. Okay, do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those that you have captured with your own sword or your bow, set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them and they had finished the eating and drinking. He sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands of Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Maybe you feel like that servant. Maybe you feel like that servant. When your day starts, you open up your, you have your coffee you open up your phone. I guess we don't flap them open anymore. We, you, you open up your phone, and then there's an army from the enemy attacking you. You open up your computer, and there's an army from in, of the enemy. You go to school, there's an army of the enemy. You go to work, there's an army of the enemy. Never give up. Never give up. What? We got good news for you. Well, I got some great news for you. 
I mean, what blows me away, right? Those that are with you are more than those that are with them. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty solid stuff right there. That's absolutely amazing. What blows my mind is that the same angels, the same, the same angels with their chariots of fire and their swords on, on fire are the same angels that are worshiping God, ministering to you, chasing after, I say chasing, worshiping him and ministering to you. The same angels. This is not fictitious. This is not days of old. This is today. I mean, the Bible says that we entertain angels. The Bible says I'm entertaining angels. A little scared there that I'm entertaining them a little too much. Kind of scared that I'm making them cry a little too much. Okay, like, holy cow, Mark, stop. Okay, but you know what? Same angels. Blows me away. Blows me away. So (laughs) for a couple weeks, I wanted to, I didn't know if I was going to tell the story. And then yesterday, I'm like, Mark, just call your mom and verify the story. So I called my mom and I verified the story because I'm like, I haven't heard this story for so long, but I've known it since I was a child. So my uncle David has been a missionary to Kenya for the last 50 years, drilling water wells and loving people right where they are before it was cool. I I, I love him. He's a great man of God. And his kids have been over in Africa for years as well since then. And when he got out over there in the early 80s or late 70s, I want to say early 80s when this story happened, his boys are older than me and he was taking them to a a boarding school, a Christian school that had opened about 30 years before before this time. So like in the 50s. And he gets to the school to drop off his two oldest boys, um, my cousins, and he's, you know, you're there for a couple days as you're dropping them off, and he's, and he's having coffee or, or having, having a nice conversation with an old-timer that was there. And the way my mom remembers it is that he was a cook. I know he worked at the school. So he's at the school. He's a cook. He's been there for 30-some years. And he tells the story to my Uncle David that... When, um, 30 years ago, when the school, so 30 years prior to this, when my, bo- when my boys, when the, my cousins were being dropped off, um, that the school was a new school. This is just north of Nairobi. The school's called RVI, Christian uh, Boarding School. And when it was first um, built and first there, that it wasn't the biggest of schools. It wasn't the, the, the uh, yet, right? So a few hundred students, the way I understand. But when it had opened, the tribes of the Maasai came together to attack the school, to burn it down. They're like, we don't want these heathen Christians in our land. And they came. And they, you know, these are the, the Maasai tribe, they're the, they're, the, they're the men that would be, and women, but very tall, the long sword, or long spears and the, the, the long um, shields, and they're the jumpers. Man, super cool, super cool people, super cool people. And they came, and there's, all these different tribes came together and came outside the gates of RVI Christian School. They, as soon as they see them, they grab all the kids, gather all the kids. As quick, I mean, can you think of this, Emily? Emily's at a Christian school. She gathers all the kids, the principals, the teachers, the coaches. They grab all the kids, and they take them to the gym, and they start pleading the blood of Jesus. They start praying in the Spirit. They pray with understanding. And you know, the principal and the guards are looking out the windows, and they see all these men. And as they're coming to attack and burn down the school, all of a sudden, they stop in their tracks, they turn around, and they run as fast as they can the other direction. Now, I, this is the part I don't know. I don't know when they found this out. The next part, I don't know when. All I know is maybe a month went by, a week went by, the next day, maybe a year went by. I'll, I don't know. But this is what happened. They, they found out that as the, as the warriors were coming to attack and burn down the school, on t- all of a sudden, there were these mighty men with, on top of the school, all across on top of the school building, on top of the roofs, with big swords that were on fire. And they thought, you know what, um, this literally, the, the words were something like, there's no way with our spears and our shields that we can um, ac- accomplish what we're here. We can't do it. They're much bigger, they're much stronger, and their swords are on fire. And they turned around and they ran. Okay, that's not even the best part of the story. Yeah, okay, come on. What blows me away, my favorite part of the story is the dude that was telling Uncle David the story was one of the warriors on the tribe. He had given his life to Jesus Christ and he was working at the school. And I mean, the, I don't know, I don't want to make up numbers. All I know is that people came to Jesus from those tribes, the Messiah tribes, those tribes gave their lives to Jesus. Those that are with us are more than those that are with them. The same angels, I mean, that's why it just blows my mind. The same angels that, are, that, are, that, are, that were there with Elisha, that the servant's eyes were open to see. They're here today. I mean, I mean, they're, they're, maybe they're not. Maybe it's their cousins and their brothers. That's fine with me. I'll take them. Okay. Maybe they're still, maybe they're still taking care of people over there in, in, in Kenya. Um, that's totally fine. Maybe they're, maybe they're in the Middle East. That's great. I'll take their cousins, but they're here today. They're here today. They're, the, man, never give up. Never give up. Those that are with you are more than those that are with them. Never, never give up. 
When we take our eyes off God's promises, all we see is an army. All we see is a wall. All we see is our sick loved one. All we see is our real life situation. But God is using that barrier to stretch us, to shape us according to his promise. Our job is to keep our eyes on Jesus, to keep worshiping him, to keep following him, to keep marching until he gives us orders to stop in celebration when he fulfills his promise. In Matthew 8, Jesus had just healed a man with leprosy, and a multitude of people were following him into Capernaum. And we're going to pick up that story right there. Matthew 8, verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came up to him and asked, Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The servant replied, Lord, I do not deserve to you to even come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. And if I say to one, go, he goes. If I say to one, come, he comes. If I say to one to do that thing, he will do it because I'm a man under authority. Now verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in all of Israel with such great faith. I say to you, that many will come from the east and from the west, and they will be, take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus turned to the centurion and said, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed in that very moment. Man, I love a good quote. I love a good quote. Um, but you know what? I, this is one becoming one of my favorite quotes ever, and that is, Jesus, just say the words. Jesus, just say the words. Jesus, just say the words. I love it because it's turning into my prayer. I mean, it's a, quotes are great, but when I can pray them to my Heavenly Father, come on, Jesus, just say the word. I, I, when you it just kind of... It kind of um, I love to think about the real life of the centurion soldier. This captain, this, um, this guy was a tyrant, or he, maybe he wasn't a tyrant, but he was part of this, this force from the Roman Empire that just took over the Mediterranean, and this is who comes to get help from Jesus. That blows me away. That, like, that's absolutely, absolutely amazing. Like, but what I like to think about is the lies that this dude had to be um, hearing from the enemy. And by the enemy, I mean the demons that are chasing after us were probably chasing after him, going, don't you know who you are? As he's walking to Jesus, don't you know who you are? He's not going to listen to you. You oppress his people. What are you doing? What are the other centurions going to think? What are your men going to think? What happens if Rome finds out that you went to a Jewish rabbi for help? But you know what I think? I think he knew how authority worked, right? He does. Jesus saw it. He said it. He's like, he had to squish those lies with every step that he took. It's like, no, 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 no. He's done it before. He'll do it again. I've heard how, like, uh, he took this water and turned it into wine. He just healed a man of leprosy. Maybe he heard that that day. And now he's walking to Jesus and going, okay, um, all I know is my servant that I love is paralyzed, and this guy has authority from God and above to, to do what only you can do, to do what only he can do, and I want my servant healed. The lies of the enemy are real. The lies of the enemy, man, the lies of the enemy are so deceitful and so delicious and so horribly crippling. I mean, am I the only one? <laughs> Sorry. The lies I hear are very <laughs> crippling. I mean, it's crazy. I absolutely, I absolutely hate them. But I do love what Jesus said, Je- or what, not what this Roman centurion said. Just say the words, Jesus. Just say the words. He didn't give up with the doubt that hit his brain. He didn't give up with the doubt that he heard. He didn't give up. When we take our eyes off of God's promises, all we see is a wall. All we see is our sick loved one. All we see is an army. All we see is our real life situation. But God is using this barrier to stretch us. He's using it to shape us according to his purpose. The barrier is there and it will come down when he is ready. Our job is to keep marching. Our job is to keep worshiping. Our job is to keep praying and believing until that barrier comes down and we shout for glory. Number one today Number one is don't stop on lap six. Don't stop on lap six. It's very simple. All I'm saying is it means it's, it's, you cannot stop too early. Don't stop prematurely. Obviously, we don't know what part of your story you're in until you're, this chapter is over. We don't know. Um, you may not know what, what lap you're on. Maybe you're on lap one. Maybe you're on lap six. Maybe you're on lap seven. Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Um, let's make, I mean, I just think of the Jericho, um, the Jericho army, that, that military, the king, as they heard those men sh- um, keep marching. 
And as they heard those trumpets blowing, I want the enemy to be scared when I pray. I want the enemy to be scared when you pray. So I'm going to pray more. I'm not going to give up, and I'm not going to stop on lap six. Philippians 3.14 says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, there's many verses that, are, that, uh, that encourage us to not quit, that encourage us to never give up, to never stop. But I like this one because I think the, the word press, press on, I think Paul knew exactly who he was talking to, being humans, <laughs> you and I, um, the, the people he wrote the letter to. Like, you're going to you're gonna have to push hard. There are going to be times that you're going to have to, it's going to be work, but don't stop. Don't give up. There are some prayers that I'm going to pray until my dying day. I may be laid down into a grave and I'm going to keep praying them. And I'm going to pray them like, but here's the deal though. I'm going to keep praying for some people in my life until they come back to Jesus. I'm going to be praying over some situations until God answers those prayers. But I'm not, I'm going to pray them until I die. He may never answer them. That is not my problem. I mean, it's my problem. I'm going to, I mean, it breaks my heart, but you know what? I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep pressing forward. And I'm going to pray like he's answering that prayer today. I'm going to pray like he's going to answer that prayer today. But you know what? I'm going to be faithful. He's faithful. Like my faithfulness is like not even in the shadow of his faithfulness. It's, it's, a, it's a, horrible, a horrible model of his faithfulness. But I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep praying. Never give up. Number two, don't stop when the lies of the enemy seem truer than the truth. Don't stop when the lies of the enemy seem truer than the truth. Now, um, this may sound a little harsh on the Word of God um, because you're like, well, that's, that's, that sound, it can sound a little harsh. Except I stand by it 100% because they wouldn't be worth lies that we believe. They wouldn't be worth believing if they weren't so stinking enticing, if they weren't so stinking um, amazing, if they weren't so delicious, that they weren't so easily to believe. I mean, I think that's why the, the lies of the enemy are the Achilles heel of the follower of Jesus that they are. We, we, they, they are so stinking delicious. And I know that word delicious, man. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Whatever your favorite food is, that's how, the, that's how Satan's like, okay, that's the kind of lie I'm going to give him. I, I mean, I'm going to get it so close. The Bible says that, the, that, the, that in the last days that the the truth will be so woven in with lies. People are going to lie to us and we're going to have to know the truth even better than we ever have. And there is only one way to know the truth and that is to be in the word of God on our own. I mean, hearing Pastor Todd and Kelly, they are amazing teachers. They are f- on fire for Jesus Christ. But if, our, if we're only eating, if we're only devouring the word of God once a week from Pastors Todd and Kelly, we are robbing ourselves of our personal relationship with Jesus. He loves you so much and he loves you right where you are, but he is desperate for personal relationship with you. The only only way that we'll ever know a decoy is if we have the truth inside of us. We will recognize the truth when we will recognize the decoy when we have the truth, when we devour the truth. And I'm not saying, I mean, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect. Lord knows no one is perfect. No one is close to perfect. And, and, and take off the guilt. I'm so tired of the guilt and condemnation or the felt that we feel on ourselves. The truth is it's not coming from most humans. Most people aren't that jerkish of a person to go, feel, you know, feel bad. You missed the word. Of, you know, you didn't pray yesterday. No, shake the condemnation off get rid of it, and then just chase after Jesus today. You missed yesterday, you missed the day before, chase after Jesus today. He's desperate for relationship with you. He's desperate for relationship with you. Never give up. I was just reading the E! News. I don't always check out the E! News. I'll be honest with you, because I'm like, if I don't know it, I got some problems, okay? But the Radiant E! News, right? Like, I was checking out. I was amazed at how many times it said everyone in the Word every day, or some version of that. I'm like, that's right. That's my, that's my leaders. Because, I mean, you know what I'm saying? The heart of Pastors Todd and Kelly are in that e-news. The heart of Pastors Todd and Kelly. It's, we must. We must be in the Word every day. And when we miss it, we don't let the condemnation get on us. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. We're going to shake that off, and we're going to chase after him today. Number three, don't stop, oh, don't stop being discipled. Don't stop discipling. Don't stop being discipled. Don't stop discipling. I believe our students um, from... Zero years old to 25 are the most compassionate generation that's ever walked on this earth. I really do mean that. They are so stinking compassionate. They are so loving. And you know why? It's because they were raised by some super compassionate people who were raised by some super compassionate hippies <laughs> um, and the Jesus, in the Jesus movement, right? Okay, so there's a whole lot of love going on. But what I found, what I have found, is that there are so many broken people trying to help broken people. So many broken, and don't get me wrong, I don't mean like in the, oh, we're broken in front of Jesus. Yes, right. But God wants to heal us and give us an abundant life so that we can be healthy. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more healthy we will be. So Jesus said this really interesting thing in, when, in verse 3. 
It says, why do we look at the speck of sawdust in our brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in our own eye? How can we say to our brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time we have a plank in our own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck of sawdust in your own eye. Jesus is not saying to not help your brother and sister. Jesus is not saying, hey, everybody, get perfect before you go help someone. He's not saying that at all. He is simply saying, let's take care of our own business. Let's continually take care of your own business. I mean, continually, over and over and over, make sure we're checking the mirror out before we try to help, or as we try to help and before we try to help other people. I believe this is a great reminder that we must always be growing in our walk with Jesus as we are being sharpened and being discipled. How many times I'm telling you, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go work on that speck in my eye. <laughs> okay, this is Pastor Mark being real. And I'm like looking in the mirror or um, I'm, I'm checking it out and it comes to find out it's a beam. It's a log. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's for real. I always try to have someone in your life that you have given permission to, to be real with you to be honest with you. Now, um, side note, even if you do that, not even if you should, we should all have someone in our life um, besides your mother-in-law. I love you, mother-in-law. Just kidding. Okay. (laughs) Just kidding. She's watching. I love you so much. Um, Because here's the deal. Even if you give permission to someone, even if you give permission to someone, it is going to be really hard to hear. And it is going to be really hard to say to someone. Because if you really love them, it's it's going to be hard. Now, if you don't like them, I mean, that's not so hard. Like, hey, you, you smell funny, right? But we should always have someone in our life. And that takes work. It takes work to find that person. It takes work to keep it going. And I have found in my, um, my years of life that I have to keep reminding my dear friends, my closest friends, you have permission. Because it is difficult. It's, it's difficult to do that. Have you ever noticed that um, when you're in an airplane, what the, the flight attendant says? It's kind of neat. Now, I didn't copy and paste it. So this is my rough version of what the, air, uh, what the flight attendant says. If the cabin pressure or cabin loses pressure, an oxygen mask will drop from above your head and your, uh, for your safety. Please pull the rubber band around your head and make sure it's secure in place. Um, sorry, secure and safety. Please pull the rubber band around your head and make sure it's secure. And please keep wearing it until the cabin or captain says otherwise. If you're traveling with a small child or someone who needs assistance, please place the oxygen mask on yourself first. And after it is secure, then you may assist your friend or your child. That sounds like Jesus to me. Okay. That's what that, I mean, I've been up there a hundred times and I'm telling you, I've never really noticed that, but that's what I think of. You want to toss that to me, Kim? Here we go. All right. So the oxygen mask drops down. What, is he, what are they saying? We all get it. If we don't put this on first, if we don't put this puppy on first, right? All right. All right. If we don't put this on first, if we try to put it on our friend or our little one or the person, our friend that needs the help, we're both going to lose oxygen and then we're going to pass out. And then, we both, then we're both unconscious. Man, that sounds like the truth with our, with our Heavenly Father and our relationship with Him. We've got to be real with ourselves. We've got to make sure that we're getting sharp, staying sharp. As we never give up, we've got to make sure that we're breathing the life. <laughs> pardon the pun. No pardon at all. Let's lead it up, right? The life that Jesus gives us through his word, through relationship, through daily relationships, through extreme discipleship of break free or your small group that you're in. I mean, that's how we hook up the oxygen to our lives. We've got to stay connected we got to stay connected to the source. And after we get connected to the source, man, it makes it so much easier. I mean, if you're a follower of Jesus and you followed him for a long time, you know what? You can fake it for a minute. You can. You can be like, okay, I haven't breathed the life from Jesus for a while. But man, I'm telling you, all I know is the more of Jesus I put inside of me, the more it naturally flows out. That overflow analogy is a real thing. Um, that, uh, I absolutely love it. Have you ever like started the dishes? Like I love to wash dishes in the sink. I know I'm crazy. My wife thinks I'm crazy. I'll turn on the hot water and then walk away and forget about it. That's awesome. But then I come back and it's just like blown, bo- bo- uh, just the, wa- the hot water. And it's just that's such, so hot and so amazing and steamy. And it just cleaned everything out. I'm like, there you go. My job's done. Of course it costs about 12 gallons of water. Forgive me. I recycle other ways. Okay. <laughs> now in conclusion, <laughs> No, we're going to read it again. We're going to read it again. When we take our eyes off of God's promises, all we see is a wall. All we see is an army. All we see is our our sick loved one. All we see is our real life situation. But God is using that barrier to stretch us, to shape us. 
according to his promise. The barrier will come down when he is ready. Our job is to keep marching. Our job is to keep worshiping. Our job is to keep following him until he gives us orders to stop in celebration when his promise is fulfilled. Now, in conclusion, I want to tell you a story. I grew up in Kansas, okay? I grew up in southeast Kansas. We didn't get a lot of snow. Um, I like snow, but we didn't get much of it. And usually about once a year, we'd get a good enough snow to go sledding. And when it did snow, we hit the hills, and we hit the hills quick. And you're like, southeast Kansas doesn't have hills. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, but it does. Okay, yes. And, but you know what we really loved? When, it got, when we had a, a decent amount of snow, I loved getting we'd get on the ATV. We had, a, we had um, you know, take the four-wheeler and then think of, of it as a death trap and like how can we make the four-wheeler more dangerous oh take a wheel off of it yeah that's right we had a three-wheeler okay it's like a death trap on wheels it was absolutely awesome um don't worry i didn't die um i'm okay so what here's what happened we would when we got some snow and this one year i was about 12 years old um, we had an amazing amount of, of snow for southeast kansas probably about 10 inches but it wasn't just the amount of snow it was the very fact that it snowed and then it sleeted and then it like frozen rain and then sleeted and snow and then sleeted and then and then it snowed like six more inches on top. It was absolutely awesome. Now I'm sure grown-ups didn't like it, I don't know, but I absolutely loved it. It was so much fun. We sled down the hill until dark, which was about five o'clock, and then we turned, uh, got out the, the three-wheeler, hooked up the sled to it, and we pulled each other for, I don't know, it seemed like hours, but when you're a kid, you know, it was probably 7 p.m. A couple hours go by, and my brother's 17, I was probably 12, so he's about five years older than me, and it was an absolute blast. We take turns pulling each other on the sled. Now, there was one objective, and that was to get the other person off the sled. That's the whole game. It's like, which is, is a lot of fun. But, you know, we had like a three-acre yard with barbed wire fence all around it and lots of apple trees um, and a tractor and some different things that you could run people into. It was absolutely awesome. So you, had to, you were forced to um, bail off the, off the sled. It was absolutely fun. Now, you would get to a point that you'd want to make it more fun, so we'd go head first, and that was great. And, but then, after a while, this particular night, I got a little um, bored. Like, it was just getting too easy or too mundane or something. I don't know. I'm like, okay, we're, I've been doing this for a while. So I'm like, what can I do to spice this up? And I closed my eyes. Ah, yeah. So now I'm holding on to the sled, and my brother is going 553 miles per hour. And he goes to the left, and I can feel it, and he goes to the left. He pulls to the right, and I can go. Now, I can't hear the three-wheeler because the, the snow muffles the sound so much, and the snow's kind of, you know, hitting you in the face. And it was absolutely awesome. Well, at that speed of 535 miles per hour, he stops, and I don't hear him stop. And I, I slide at 535 miles per hour to the end or to the tail light of that three-wheeler. And I smash that tail light like it's a cracker, guys, with my forehead right here. Okay, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, I kid you not, when you leave today, you go back to the back of your car and you see that red tail light, you just go like this. Pastor Mark's forehead broke that tail light just like that one time. I know, I know, Ty, Ty, that, that, Ty that's, that, that um, answers a lot of questions, doesn't it? <laughs> like, right? Well, I jumped up and I had one of those 1980 ski masks on, you know, super fuzzy, itched like crazy with just two eye holes, right? I pulled that puppy off and the blood, because I had the mask, the, the mask, as I pulled it off, it smeared blood all over my face. It was super cool. Uh, it looked like my brother had tried to murder me. I run inside to um, my mom and she just cleans me up, puts a couple butterfly stitches on it. It was, it was all right. I mean, it was sliced to the bone, but we didn't go to the hospital unless something was like falling off. Um, and... It, we have some hot cocoa and we laugh and we have a, have a good night. But you know what? I live that story out continually through my grown-up life. I think of it often about keeping my eyes on Jesus and, keeping my, and taking my eyes off of him. Because what I've found is that when I keep my eyes on him, when I, when I keep marching and keep chasing after him, in my, my, the giving up part, now don't get me wrong, there's still tough days. There's still, I mean, crazy, crazy hard days, crazy hard situations that we walk through, but they become so much more doable, so much more ch a chance for me to hang on when I keep my eyes on Jesus. If I would have taken, kept my eyes on that stupid tail light, right? I would have seen the tail light hit the brake light and then I would have jumped off. It'd have been no big deal. And I find that this seems like the, the, the hardest things today or the easiest things today can make such a huge difference in my tomorrow. And and I, and I want to keep my eyes on Jesus 
every day. When we take our eyes off of God's promises, all we see is a wall, all we see is an army, all we see is a sick loved one, all we see is our real life situation, but God is using this barrier to stretch us, to shape us according to his promises. And all we gotta do, not all we have to do, but our job is to keep worshiping, to following him until he says to stop, never give up. When I take my eyes off Jesus, walls get bigger, the army gets bigger, the lies get bigger. It's absolutely harder, but when I keep my eyes on him, it changes everything. Today, I want to invite you to stand up as our worship team comes forward. Um, if you're here today, um, I want to invite you to follow. Um, if you have not had the amazing opportunity to give your life to Jesus, today is your day. I want to just ask you to raise your hand if you have not had an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. If you're t- Today is your day and he's calling you. He's like, today I am calling you I, and he loves you so much right where you're at. Will you bow your heads and pray this simple prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for giving us your son. I believe in Jesus. I give my heart to you. I give my life to you. I repent of all my sins. I dedicate my life to your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Um, so now we're going to end a little bit differently before we pass um, this on to the campus pastors in just a moment. Um, I'm, I'm believing. I, You know, um, if, if you're here today and you have a sickness and you have um, an ailment, maybe you have a disease, I'm going to ask you to place your hand on that part of your body and we're going to pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Because as we never give up, we're going to um, believe in the mighty name of Jesus as we believe in him. And he's going to heal a body today in the mighty name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I come to you. Um, I come to you with confidence and I come to you humbly. And God, I ask you in the mighty name of Jesus uh, that you are the God who heals. So if there's someone here today with cancer in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that that cancer is gone. It is dissolved. It falls off in Jesus' mighty name. I pray I command MS to be out of here in Jesus' name. That legions, lesions on the brain are healed. That symptoms of MS are gone in Jesus' mighty name. I believe it. And you said it would be, you've done it before. Just say the words, God, and do it again in Jesus name. And I pray God for the barren womb. God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that they will be fruitful and that their babies will be born in Jesus mighty name. God, we command it in your name, Jesus. I pray for every sickness. I pray for crippled legs to be healed. I pray for ears to hear in Jesus name, not by might nor by power, but by your son, Jesus. And we pray these things and thank you, God, for what you've done and what you're doing. In Jesus' name, we all said amen amen and amen. What a strong message from Pastor Mark up at our North Campus. I'm going to go ahead and call our prayer teams forward. And just in the the posture of what Pastor Mark just set up, right, is that no matter what you're going through, maybe it's not a, a healing you need in your body, but You just need some direction in your life. You just need some kind of wisdom, whatever that may look like. We have our prayer warriors up front here that are waiting to pray for you. So as we get ready to dismiss you, don't just run out of here. Run to the altar. Run to get prayer today. Um, And don't forget, if you are not part of Break Free, get into Break Free this coming Wednesday and join a group here at Central Campus. Uh, We start at 6.30 p.m. We've got open groups, men's groups, women's groups, and even our youth is doing something on youth at Sunday nights, and then they're meeting as a group here in North Campus and Woodland Park on Wednesdays. So make sure you get into a break-free group. Don't let the enemy lie to you and say anything like, if I didn't start that, I can't finish it. No, just start it when you can, which is right now. But I'm going to pray for you guys, and then I'll dismiss you. Heavenly Father, thank you for never giving up on us. And God, thank you for the reminder that we never need to give up on you. We never need to give up on anyone that we have in our lives. Lord, I pray that this week you will open up opportunities for us to show those who feel like they have been given up on, to show those who feel like they want to give up the love of Jesus, to say, keep your eyes focused on Jesus and never give up. Father, I pray a fresh blessing and a fresh anointing over everyone that is here at all of our campuses, everyone watching online. Give us the words and the wisdom to speak truth in life. And that comes straight from the gospel. It comes from your word. So give us a desire to dig in 
dig deep into the Radiant Word reading plan. And Father, we just give you all the praise, honor, and glory. Let us be an example for this world, the love of Jesus that flows from us this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Radiant Church, we love you. God bless you. We will see you next week. Have a great day.